morning and welcome to church. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Anybody just want to give him some praise because he's a good God? Stand right now if you are able. Come on down to the front. Let's worship our King. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than our fear. The tide is rising, rising. There is a current stirring deep inside. It's overflowing from the heart of God. The flood of heaven rushing over us. The tide is rising, it's rising and bursting. Thank you so much for your presence in this house this morning. Father, we just want to worship you. We just want to worship you and let your spirit have its way. Sing this with me. Thank you. 
Have you ever heard somebody say, tell the devil no, not today? Yeah, it's been one of those mornings. But you know what I love about our God? If we just lay back and trust him, everything is possible. We can sing through a voice that doesn't work. We can praise through a scream that goes down because it's not about the words. Collectively, us coming together to meet corporately is about raising up the banner of Jesus Christ, being kingdom-minded in this house, amen? So this morning, let us take our kingdom mind and set it on the things above and let us continue to praise. pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered rendered and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set
Heavenly Father, it's so tender to be in worship today and sing about getting glimpses of you in our lives. It's pretty amazing the different ways we get to see you. Sometimes it's grandma's prayers that sustained us and we didn't even know it and we figured it out later in life realize that long before we were even aware of who you really are, somebody was fighting for our faith. Sometimes we see that doe-eyed look in a little child, all innocent and needing to be protected and covered, and we realize that life is this precious gift and causes us to rise up and say, I, I want this next generation to, to be under the safe covering of the Lord. We see how you meant for things to be. Lord, we see you when somebody's willing to ask forgiveness. You know, we're mad at them and this could be a, a forever end to the friendship and somebody steps over the divide and says, hey, forgive me. And we have to make a decision. Are we going to be a Christian? Are we going to go ahead and let somebody make a mistake? People let us make mistakes. Lord, it would be so fantastic if we would be able to show you to the world by carrying out your way of life. Letting your spirit determine our attitude at all times so that people would be able to understand what grace looks like by <clears throat> interacting with us. Somebody's misbehaving at work and we, we show compassion. We choose to invest in them instead of write them off. Kind of like the way you invest in us instead of writing us off. That we'd be prayer warriors, intercessors, People don't even know that they're on our list and that we're asking the Spirit of God to embrace them and draw them into a relationship. Paul planted Apollos water that God caused the growth to know that you're behind whatever we're doing. To remember Isaiah 55, 11, that nothing my word does not go forth without accomplishing what I intended it to accomplish. And when we step forward with Christ's heart and your good intentions, Heavenly Father, all that can occur, wow. Let more happen in our lives, Father. We're so used to soaking up the blessings. We're so used to dragging our problems into your presence and saying, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. And we forget that yeah, he always does. He's intimately acquainted with all of our ways. He promises to protect and cover and provide. But he's asking us to step on, out on behalf of others. So today, may we take that calling and place that mantle upon ourselves and take responsibility for those under our sphere of influence. May we bring you glory, Lord, by letting the eyes of Jesus Christ look through our lenses and see the hurting and, and be willing to, to embarrass ourselves by initiating a conversation, a spiritual conversation. Help us to hear with your ears the words of hurting people or sometimes they're not even spoken, Lord. Give us that supernatural intuition. May our lives count and our faith matter and our Christianity make a difference. 
May we increase the population of heaven. May we release the touch of God, the fingerprints of the Lord all over the place. The Spirit of God dwells in us. May the Spirit of God be released out from us. And Spirit, I ask right now that you would move upon everybody in the sanctuary. Everybody. We're all on a journey with you. We all have things going on in our lives. We all have people that we're worried about. We all have thank yous because you answered a prayer. We all have hope. And so we take a quiet, personal moment right now to speak to you from the heart. Ah, what a moment. To first worship you and then lay our hearts before you. And to have you definitively promise to be involved in our lives. Even when we're not paying attention to you, you're paying attention to us. Oh, Lord, may we always be paying attention to you because you are the source of life and blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another. Well, we had some people join the church yesterday, they, and we want to bring them forward right now so they can make it official. If you want to join the church, come forward right now. It's on. Okay. We had some people in early service. We got people coming up at the next service. 
Come on forward. We accept Brazilians, okay? <laughs> so happy you're here. <clears throat> well, we had a lot of fun yesterday uh, talking about the Lord, explain to everybody what we're about, what we believe, the, the vision and mission of our church, and these beautiful people decided to participate with us and make it official. Remember, membership has its privileges, okay? So uh, they decided to join with us. And I want you to hear the words of our Lord. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I've appointed you that you should go bear fruit. And what's amazing is when we go forth in the name of Jesus, that fruit remains because the eternal God is the one moving through us. And so as you come forward right now to, to make a, a faith statement, I, I want you to know that <clears throat> Jesus says, whoever confesses me before others, I will profess before the Father in heaven. And, and that's a pretty big statement. So the question of the morning is, who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? Do you intend to be his disciple, obey his word, and show his love? Will you be a faithful member of our congregation? Well... Guess what? It's that simple. Welcome to the family of God, okay? <clears throat> Before you sit down, I want, I want you to take the mic and, you know, introduce yourself. Just introduce yourself. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Tarcísio Ximenez. I am originally from Brazil. And I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm John, and this is my wife, Emily. She's very happy that I took from the mic from her because she's very nervous. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Go ahead. <laughs> um, my name is Mitch Bayshore, and um, it's about time, right? <laughs> I thought maybe you could answer a question like, Predestination, explain the difference. <laughs> well, we're having that class right after this. And that's the other class, okay. <laughs> well, friends, I'm so excited that you're part of our, our family right now, and we're anticipating that God is going to rest upon you, move in you and through you, and you're going to be an amazing addition to the, to the ministry here, and we hope also to be a, a great addition to your spiritual journey as well. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> We have a few announcements. Um, actually, somebody hit me up at the door and said, Pastor, the Hope Center doesn't have toilet paper. And I don't think they mean in the Hope Center. I think they mean people need toilet paper. So when you go to the grocery store, could you pick up a little extra toilet paper? We'll get it delivered to the people who are in need at the Hope Center, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> We've got our breakfasts starting up next week, Father's Day. Okay, so... Sorry you had to go two weeks without it, but it's on now, and so uh, come and feast. But don't eat too much, because then you'll be all satisfied, and you won't pay attention to the sermon, all right? So just enjoy the breakfast with us. We've got summer journey happening. If you have kids, K through fifth grade, we've got a program for your children, so uh, please uh, sign up and, and call the office and find, up, find out about it. We got a new life group taking place in Point Siena. Anybody out in Point Siena? I've got a life group for you. This is a good one. The information is here in the bulletin. I want you to, to know that. And <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, I asked if somebody would step forward and take charge of the senior saint ministry. Somebody did. Not only did they say I'm willing to do it, they came forward with the vision and the plan. They're just asking for about three or four couples to partner with them, and then we're going to release an incredible ministry here in our church for our senior saints. So uh, if you would be willing to be a part of that team, we need you, we want you. Uh, don't make me go calling your phone and asking you to, to show up, okay? I want you to participate if you will. Friends, we've got all kinds of really neat ministries taking place here in the church places for you to get involved in life groups. And remember, life groups is a place for you to, to really study the word and enjoy some lifelong friendships and, and, and see the power of God move in your life. 
Uh, it's, it's all New Testament Christianity. That's the way it's supposed to be. So prioritize being in life groups. Lots of Bible studies, places to serve. You know, Christianity comes alive when you get involved. And so uh, let, let's get involved and watch God use you powerfully. By the way, if you're a guest today, welcome. In fact, on the seat back in front of you, you should find a white and green card. I'd love to have you pull it out, fill it out, place it in the offering plates as they circulate, okay? On these cards is a prayer request line. <clears throat> if you have something going on in your life, write it down. It comes directly to me, and I pray for you. So take advantage of the extra prayer support. And one more thing, for those in the center aisles, if you'd be willing to pull out the friendship pads, this is our way of finding out who came to church, your way of finding out who you're worshiping alongside of. It's a chance for you to make a friend. Unless, of course, you have your own pew, okay? <laughs> well, then you have to go that way, okay? Make friends that way, okay? So glad you're here in church today. Go. Well, we come to you today for our tithes and offerings. And I wanted to tell you a couple of things about this. Offering is an act of both your worship and it's an act of your will. All right, worship like this. I saw a documentary this past week that I thought was really fascinating, and it was on, a, on a, the death of uh, uh, the, the leader of North Korea before the guy that's in there now, Kim Jong-il. And uh, it was amazing how people, families who'd never met this guy, just were so upset when he died. Children just, I mean, incredible how the entire nation just went into mourning when this guy died. And it shocked me because I thought, they never met him. All they knew was about him. They had pictures of him. They'd read stories about him. Everything was focused on him, but they had never had any personal contact with or personal relationship with him at all. A lot of Christians are like that. They have a lot of knowledge about God and maybe even a hard appreciation for God, but have never had an encounter with God where they hear his voice. And offerings are born out of a connection with God where he begins to speak to our hearts and we act in obedience. That's an act of worship. But the other part is an act of your will. Now, if I said to you today, hey, take your wallet or your checkbook out and hand it to your neighbor, and now give like you've always wanted to give. <laughs> that wouldn't be an act of worship. It wouldn't be an act of generosity because it's actually impossible to be generous with somebody else's money, at least not from your own heart. And ultimately, acts of worship are beautiful, but th there comes a point where offering also becomes an act of your will. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Let each person determine in his own heart how much he should give. Not grudgingly, but God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, he, he wants you to actually come up with an idea of what you want to do. See, on one hand, offerings are an act of worship. But on the other hand, a heart of generosity comes from willful surrender to say, God, I want to give back to you a portion of what you have given to me. It's a recognition of what he's done for you. And that's how we cultivate a heart of worship and a heart of generosity is when we live in obedience to him and also surrender our will to do something of service for him. Today, there's three different ways you can give in this church. You can give through the offering envelopes that are on the seat backs that are in front of you. And you can also give by texting the word COMPRESS, C-O-M-M-P-R-E-S, to the number 77977. You can also give on the COMPRESS app, which is incredibly easy to do. And you should all give it a try this morning, except it's really easy to hit an extra zero in there, which we love that, but sometimes by accident. Anyhow. Um, but we encourage you this morning, let this offering time be both an act of worship and your will. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this time today, Lord, as we receive these offerings today. God, let these, these moments not be something that's an act of just ritual. But God, let them just be a, a moment of worship, of connection, of heart connection, obedience to your voice. But God, cultivate within us a heart of generosity today. And we surrender our our will, God. We just surrender to give back to you because you are a giver and we're made in your image and likeness. So thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to worship you with our tithes and offerings today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen.
my soul Stand and watch as giants fall I won't be afraid You are here You silence all my fears I won't be afraid You don't let go Be still my heart and know So I'm going to do something that I don't recall ever doing before, but I probably have. I'm going to preach another sermon on the same thing I talked about last week. Part two, you might say, okay? Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And you will be my people and I will be your God. This is the word of the Lord. You know, I'm one of those guys that only reads the New American Standard. I hand out the NIV for, you know, lesser minds. <laughs> I give the message out every now and then. People say, you know, I just don't understand it. I got people reading children's Bible. I give out children's Bibles, okay. But the message is one of those Bibles that, that really takes the Word of God and puts it into a, a, a language you can understand. And <clears throat> I was reading the message this week and I came across Romans 7. What I don't understand about myself is I decide one way, but I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. 
So I can't be trusted to figure out what's best for my life and then do it. It's obvious God's command is necessary, but I need something more. For though I know the law, I can't keep it, as the power of sin in me keeps sabotaging my best intentions. Does this sound like a familiar experience for most of us? Friends, I know how to get you out of this trap. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. Is that something more that we need? Otherwise, temptation's always going to hamstring us. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine about temptation. He goes, oh, I know how to deal with temptation. I said, what do you do? He goes, I always give in to it. <laughs> and the problem is with giving in to temptation, it becomes a habit. And then like a wagon that makes ruts in the road, it's easier and easier to just stay in that rut and to continue to give in. And then the next thing you know, you live a defeated life. Here you are, in possession of the Spirit of God, able to release the power of God, the touch of God, the Word of God. And we're stuck in some self-oriented rut, being basically inefficient with our faith. And this is what happened to the people of God in our passage in Ezekiel. They'd gotten into the rut of sin. Um, <clears throat> there was extreme promiscuity. Uh, with their own personal lives, there was idol worship where they, they brought all their other idols into the temple of the Lord and just completely desecrated it. They were doing child sacrifice and oppressing the poor and the weak. Bloodshed and violence was the norm in Jerusalem. And, and here's what you have to know about God. He'll put up and tolerate some disrespect. But when injustice against the poor and, and the oppression of the week takes place, he decides to get involved. And the Lord removed his people to a foreign land in Babylon. And I want to show you something powerful about God. Our God, in his judgment, it's not his last word. His judgment doesn't last forever. His grace is his last word. And this is what he does with his people. He decides to give them that second chance to get back into a relationship with him. He's the God of second chances. You might need to be reminded of that today. He is the God who's saying, yeah, yeah, I know you did that. I knew you were going to do that. I provided the cross for that. Now come back into a relationship with me. And, and <clears throat> what's cool about God is he can use pagan kings to orchestrate his will for his people which he does, he brings them back to Jerusalem. But God, he's a history buff. He knows what happens, that history repeats itself. That the people of God are going to go back into sinful lifestyles and back into pursuing various idols. And so he decides to put a new heart into his people. This is the only way to overcome the sinful nature. And he gives them a heart transplant. No longer will their hearts be hard towards God. He's going to give them that new inclination to respond to his love. See, that's what the sinful nature does. It makes us incapable of responding to God. You know, our, our, it's only when God gets inside of us that we move from self-destructive behaviors to being people who empower others with the, the, the love and grace of God. God can break that death grip of sin on our lives. And he proved it when Jesus rose from the dead. There's the kind of power that's available to you. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. And how it works is he changes us from the inside out. You know, we like to think, well, I'm going to get myself in order and then I'll be right with God. And that's not the way it works. You give the inside of yourself over to the Lord. And suddenly you start caring about what he cares about and, and, and loving the people he loves. And, and the next thing you know, you're a different person. You have to understand something. You move from having little interest in spiritual things to being consumed with this amazing God who loves you. Now, I don't know if you heard about the couple in the marriage counseling office. <clears throat> it was their first time when the therapist asked them to identify the root of the problem. 
And the wife responded, well, it all started when we thought it would be cute to think up each other's New Year's resolutions. Okay? Could you imagine your spouse saying, I've got New Year's resolutions for you. Yeah, well, I got some New Year's resolutions for you. That's the beginning of a problem. So I'm going to suggest the best one to get advice about our character development is probably God Almighty. Because the truth of the matter is we don't see what is so obvious to somebody else. You know, o Lloyd Ogilvy in the book Enjoying God, he says one of the most astounding achievements in ophthalmology is the ability to implant new lenses into the human eye. This one man got both of his eyes refreshed with new lenses, and he said how wonderful it is to have new eyes. And friends, in Ephesians 1.18, it refers to the eyes of our heart. You see, before we got brought into a relationship with God, you know, our, our heart had some cataracts. We weren't able to see like we should. We didn't see ourselves the way we were supposed to. We didn't vi visualize others as people made in the image of God. We never saw the true nature uh, of God himself. We were spiritually blinded. And then the Spirit of God brings Jesus into our hearts. We get converted. We now understand that the cross is the forgiveness of God so that we have access to the throne of grace. But that's just the beginning. You weren't saved so that we'll see you in heaven. No, God has a plan for your life. There's a power that's supposed to be released within you. And we need this new supernatural lens from the eyes of our heart to be able to go forward, to be able to conquer the old self. Yeah, it's done. It's not going to determine your eternal fate anymore. But now you're to walk with the Lord, and the only way to do that with his spirit guiding you. And let me put it into a different context. Sometimes we come to church and we ask God to fill us. But the truth of the matter is we're so full of other stuff that there's no room for God to put anything into us afresh. There's no opportunity for him to reshape us because we're already stuffed with the world that we brought in. I don't know if you're aware of this, but at restaurants, it's illegal to be served food on a dirty plate. In fact, if you go to a salad bar, there's a sign posted by the health department that requires every time you step up to the buffet, you have to get a new plate, a clean plate. And I tell you this because there's lots of people in the world that are, that are stepping up to God and they're wanting something from them and, and they don't get anything from them and they get upset and then they say, well, you know, I asked God for this and nothing happened and so I'm not interested in this guy that you're pushing, Pastor. And it's going, wait a minute. You've you got to approach God a certain way. you got to come and let him serve you. You have to let him bring you the plate that will feed your soul and, and empower your life, okay? You step up to God's banquet and, and what he's got for you requires a clean plate. You know, when we get baptized, Jesus is what? Washing away the dirt of sin and replacing it with the Holy Spirit's presence. This is what's required to, to, to have this relationship with God. And let's not minimize what Jesus would do in people's lives. He comes across a former prostitute. He says, no problem. You're going to become an example of my precious holy love. He comes across a forward, former coward. You're going to become a legendary leader, a former skeptic. You're going to become the deepest of believers, a clean plate, a clean slate. A new beginning is available for everybody who walked with Jesus. They were given a new identity. No leftovers. No Past sins defining them anymore. Unwashed resentments were replaced with compassion. Disappointments in life were, were changed out with a new vision from heaven. See, friends, God gives us a new spirit, a, do, a new dynamic, a new power. I, I was moved by Pastor Bill's sermon a couple of weeks ago when he talked about Paul's ministry in Athens. He brought a bunch of philosophical words to the philosophers. And when he went to Corinth, his ministry was the demonstration of the spirit and power. Two completely different outcomes. We're supposed to bring the spirit and power. 
Now, I did have somebody ask for a clarification from last week's sermon because I said the Holy Spirit didn't come to give us special powers. He came to give us Jesus. And they said, well, I thought you get special powers when the Holy Spirit comes. Well, this is what the Spirit does. It reveals all that Jesus said and meant. In John 15, 26, he will testify about me. John 16, 14, he will glorify me and will take of mine and disclose it to you. And I want you to realize Having Jesus is a supernatural experience. This is God the Son in your life right now. And the way he manifests himself is through his spirit. Okay? It is a supernatural lifestyle that's available to you. But this isn't a spiritual toy so that you can have a spiritual buzz. No. There are some denominations that believe you have to manifest the tongue, speak in tongues in order to prove that you're a Christian. That's not in the Bible. That's not good theology. However, I think it would be a shame to go through your spiritual life and never experience the power of God, never have answered prayers, never any special encounters, never healing somebody. 18% of the Gospels is Jesus healing. It's obviously a theme that's available to us. And it happens when we repent. Change the direction of our lives away from being self-oriented to becoming God-focused. And the only way that happens is when the Spirit of God introduces Jesus to you and then takes you by the hand into the new relationship. This is where we get reshaped. Remember in Jeremiah 18, the potter didn't put patch up the vessel. He remolded it all together. In Genesis 32, Jacob didn't discuss theology with God. No, he wrestled with him until he received a blessing. The Canaanite woman didn't accept Jesus' suggestion that her daughter wasn't an option for divine healing. But she fought for any of the, clum the crumbs that would come from God's table. Friends, there's more to be had from the Lord than just being saved. And God gets excited when you go after it. In fact, this morning, we have an opportunity to experience God's reshaping power and the guidance of his spirit in our lives. He offers a three-course spiritual meal. First, it's the bread of life, Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh who came to save us from sin. This is the main course. Then we enjoy the fruits of the Spirit, replacing our broken attitudes with God's heart and mind, now determining the way we go through our every day. And we wash it all down with the living water, God's grace. We're never thirsty for anything else again because we have tasted of the divine presence and power, and this is the way we live forever. See, the Spirit, it brings life so that you don't have to settle on the ordinary eat, sleep, and work routine. Let's be honest, that routine can drain the life right out of you. And there's supposed to be more to our life. It's the presence of God involved. I was reading about Robert Robertson from 1735 to 1790. He got saved under the ministry of George Whitfield, the great evangelist during the Great Awakening. And this guy even entered into Christian ministry, but... He tended to wander from God. He's the guy who wrote the, the hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. It's actually an autobiographical sketch of his spiritual life. In stanza three, he admits he has a daily debt to grace. And he asks God to help him with his wandering heart. You know, oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to wander from the God I love. I got to admit, every time I sing this hymn, ah, don't you tend to identify a little bit with this? Well, one day this guy's on a stagecoach. And he's behaving in a manner that made a fellow traveler think he doesn't know Jesus. So she decides, I'm going to tell him about the Lord. And as she's sharing her faith, she actually quotes his hymn, saying, these words have helped me and they might help you. Now he starts sobbing. He can't believe this. You know, and he just said, ma'am, 
I'm the poor, wretched man who wrote this hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds to have those feelings once again. What happened to him? I'll tell you what happened to him. Friends, when the Lord arrives in our lives, he inclines us towards God. But he doesn't take our will away from us. If we choose to ignore the spiritual promptings, they're going to get shoved to the back of our lives, and, and, and we're going to become callous to them. You know, irresistible grace, it's not some sort of blind force that drags the struggling, rebellious sinner into a place that he doesn't want to go. Okay? It's not like a, a, a policeman dragging a criminal into a jail. It, 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 this is not something that compels you to enter heaven if you'd prefer not to be there. No, irresistible grace is God working within our hearts so that the, the knee that would not bow before happily does so now. The heart that, that didn't care a thing about God is now interested in what he has to bring to us. And once you see who God is, oh, it's an irresistible invitation to live with this God who made you and loves you. You know, when I was a young man, I had a construction job. Uh, no skill set. I was just the guy that had to do all the cleanup, okay? You know, here's the wheelbarrow. Put all those bricks in there. Or here's the shovel. Get rid of that pile, you know? And so here I am, wheeling stuff around and shoveling. And my hands were not used to this kind of hard labor. And they started blistering up until finally I got some calluses. And, and, and the hard work didn't bother me anymore. And I tell you this because in a similar way, God has given us hearts that are sensitive to his presence and leading. But when we continually resist the Spirit's promptings, our hearts become callous. We start to lose our sensitivity. You see, God will say, no, no, I don't want you to speak that way. And we know he's going to say that, so we get in the habit of tuning him out. And suddenly, we don't hear him anymore. I used to live by the train tracks. It's true, I lived on the wrong side of the tracks, okay? And you would hear the trains coming, and it was real exciting until it just became the normal sound, and you never really heard it anymore. This is what I'm talking about. The Spirit of God is constantly speaking, constantly inviting, constantly drawing you into the things of God. That's why Jesus says, let him who has ears to hear hear. It's not because they can't hear, it's because they're not listening. And friends, Hebrews 3.12 says, see to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. I'm going to give you a personal example of this. Recently, I, I, I noticed that I was not responding to certain situations the way I knew God would want me to respond. I recognized I wasn't in the place I should be from the heart. So I got on my knees and I said, Lord, um, I'm not handling this the way you want me to handle it. Change my heart. Break my heart. Let me not be callous. Refresh me with the Holy Spirit. And when you know, immediately I had opportunities to practice my brand new prayer. But see, friends, it's being in tune enough with what God wants from us, what God wants to bring to us, that we can recognize where we're supposed to be, measure whether we're there, and then ask the Spirit of God to close that gap. In other words, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Otherwise, you're going to fill your soul up with junk food. You can go to bed at night on your phone or watching television, or you can close the evening and with the chapter of the Bible and a prayer. You know, I want you to think about it. If your floors were dirt paths, what would be more well-worn? The path to your computer and the television or the path to your prayer spot in your Bible? It would tell a lot about what's going on spiritually. And friends, if you're in a rut, this is what Paul says in Philippians 4, 8. Whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. The other day, I noticed that at a normal time in my life, every day I usually think about God. And here I was in that normal time when I wasn't thinking about God. I go, ooh, 
What's going on? This is my God time, and he's not on my mind. Had to make some adjustments. See, it's being able to recognize, and you know what? It's not because I could recognize it. It's because the Spirit of God is going, hey, this is our time. This is, this is when you and I meet. This is when you get empowered. This is when you lift up praises. This isn't when you waste thoughts on such little things. It's God pulling you, prompting you, tugging you back into a relationship with him. You know, this one politician roared at the newspaper editor, what do you mean by publicly insulting me in your paper? I demand an apology. The editor said, you know, the news item appears exactly as you gave it to us. You resigned as the city treasurer. He said, yes, I did, but it's where you put it, it's the problem. You put it right under the heading, public improvements. Any public improvements happening in your life, friends, it's because it should be under the heading Holy Spirit Construction Project. This is how it works. You know, my wife, a long time ago, she said to me, I want the gift of tongues. I said, you're never going to get the gift of tongues. You're too smart. You're going to overanalyze it. You're going to overthink it. You're going to use that superior mind of yours and try to control it. It's for people like me who are dummies, okay? <laughs> and it's the same with healing. There's a certain amount of letting go required when you walk in the spirit. You know, I'm called to pray for somebody's healing. And then, is it a stage one or a stage four? Because that's going to determine my prayer. Because medically speaking and scientifically, this shouldn't happen. No. Don't overthink it. Say, wow, somebody's in need of a touch from God. Let me hit my knees. Let me bring the spirit of God into it. Let's plan on the mercy of God showing up somehow, somewhere, some way. You know, I, I had this cool experience. This man who's part of our snowbird population, he showed up outside of the snowbird season. I go, hey, what are you doing here? He goes, well, Pastor, I, I got cancer right now, and um, I wanted to come here so that I could get prayed for in this church. Because he knows that there's power here. And then he went on to tell me a story. He goes, you know, when I was a little boy, I got into some kind of an accident. And he goes, I, I was at the doctor. And you could actually see the gangrene moving up my arm. And the doctor said, we're going to have to cut your arm off at the elbow because uh, this is, is, I've never seen it move so rapidly before. Well, at home, his grandma was praying for him, pacing the kitchen praying for her grandson, asking God to heal him. And then about 2.20 in the morning, she finally handed it over to the Lord and went to bed. Well, it turns out that at 2.20 in the hospital room, the doctors were amazed because as they were getting ready to cut his arm off, they saw the gangrene retreat from his hand altogether, completely healed. Well, that's not supposed to happen. Well, it is when you belong to Jesus Christ and you got grandma praying for you. And I'd like to suggest that you be somebody's prayer warrior or an intercessor. Friends, this is how the Holy Spirit operates, guiding us to what seems to be the opposite of common sense. It's exactly the will of God. I'll, I'll give you another story. During World War II, there in Sussex, England, this man sent some money to the Scripture Gift Mission. And he enclosed a letter saying he longed to give more, but the harvest on his farm had been very disappointing because of the lack of water. And he also was fearful because German bombs were being dropped in the area and his farm and his family might, were at risk. So he asked the workers at the scripture gift mission to pray that no bombs would fall on his land. Well, the, the leader of the mission writes back and says, I, I feel the spirit of God telling me not to pray this prayer but rather that God's will would prevail for you. Well, shortly after, a huge German bomb crashed down on the farm, and none of the man's family or, or, or farm or livestock were harmed, but the bomb went so far into the ground that it liberated a submerged stream that yielded enough water to irrigate the man's farm and the neighboring farms. The next year, he had a bountiful harvest and was able to send a large offering to the mission. You go, wow. You see, maybe even the bombs that come into our lives 
are gifts from heaven to pull us back into a relationship with him, to release blessings that we had no idea were available to us, that living water would come forth in our lives. And, and, and let me get personal with some of you seniors. You know, I know that you don't get enough exercise. And so in his wisdom, God decreed that seniors become forgetful so that they'd have to search for their glasses, their keys, and other things, and thus do more walking. And then God, in his wisdom, he made seniors lose their coordination so that they would drop things, requiring them to bend and reach and stretch. And then God considered the function of the bladder and decided that seniors would need additional calls of nature, making more trips to the bathroom and thus getting more exercise. So if you find at your age all this is happening, it might actually be a gift from God. Well, let me close things up here, friends. I used to be a chaplain at the UCLA Medical Center. And uh, I encountered this one guy who had just received a heart transplant from a 16-year-old girl. And, and it was really a crazy scene that the girl's parents had just been in the room with him. He represented their daughter, and as they left and I came in, I, I chatted with them, and I asked, what's it like to have somebody else's heart beating in you? And he says, I feel like there's another person inside of me, like I'm wrapped around someone else. And friends, this is exactly how it is for us. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Friends, Jesus is your heart donor, and yes, somebody had to die in order for you to receive it. He did. Your new heart, it comes from Jesus, whose cross was the spiritual surgery you desperately needed to overcome this sinful world and enjoy the presence of God. And the spirit of the man who died for you now lives alongside of and within you. It's the spirit of God. And I wanted to come back to this to remind you that the Spirit of God, part of the Trinity, lives within you, available to you, helping you to overcome that rut in life, that inability to conquer something. Because if you tune into the Spirit's guidance and activate His presence intentionally, your Christianity is going to become an adventure of faith. And I mean, amen. Have a fantastic week. Have a spirit-filled week. Have a God week. Amen. Just faith and grace alive.